I'm Donald Moffat. And I'm Heather Menzies. Logan's Run will not be on tonight. But stay tuned for the Charlie Brown special and the Fat Albert Halloween special. And we'll be back next Monday night. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Coming February 21st, it's Faye and the Moon, the latest graphic novel from Franco and the Saturn Sisters. Faye, mourning for her missing mother, sits night after night below the moon that her mother loved dearly. One night she discovers she can pluck the moon out of the star-filled sky. Back safe in her house, she holds it close, feeling comfort at last. Then Faye loses the moon and finds that taking it has awakened ancient monsters, rats, dragons, and more who hunt for it for themselves. Will Faye be able to reclaim the moon, find her own inner strength, and save the world from eternal darkness? Faye and the Moon comes from the minds of Franco, whose works include Tiny Titans, Superman of Smallville, Archimaniacs, Itty Bitty Hellboy, and The Ghost and the Owl, and art from the Saturn Sisters, whose animated works include Sesame Studios' The New Neighbors, Hulu's The Awesomes by Seth Meyers, and PBS's Mira, Selkie from the Sea. Pre-order Faye and the Moon now, available in bookstores and comic shops everywhere, February 21st. back everybody time again for word balloon the comic book conversation show john suntress here always happy to see mark wade it's been a while but great to see you my man good to see you sir it has been a while let's do this more frequently i'm all for it mark seriously i didn't want to bug you because you were so great to me and uh the others that were putting on online conventions yeah. and man we had a great time doing the especially that kingdom come table yeah. we did with uh susan Eisenberg and george newburn and you narrating that was a lot of fun. And, and other, I got you interviewing Brevoort. I thought yeah. was the best. That's so, a lot of fun. So truly, man, no, uh, we we all really appreciated your Thanks. participation on that stuff. And we're almost back to normal times. Almost. Almost. Uh, <laughs> are you uh, off the bat? Uh, uh, what are your convention plans this year? Gosh. Um, yeah. the I know. I know. There's there's an awesome con in, in Richmond I'm doing. Uh, not Richmond. Uh, Washington, D.C., um, you know what? Here, let's just go to the calendar. You had you you caught me completely by surprise. Oh, I'm so sorry, buddy. Yeah. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's look at the let's look at the show list, shall we? Um, Washington D.C. the weekend of April 14th. We got. Uh, let's see, uh, Phoenix Fan Fest in the first of June. Nice. We got Seattle on the 23rd of June. Emerald City. We got uh, Cleveland somewhere in here. Raleigh, we've got on uh, the end of July. Goober says, hey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Baltimore Comic Con, of course. Austin Galaxy Con, the 1st of September. Uh, and there's a couple more that we haven't nailed down yet. I'm, you know, as you say, we're close to being back to normal. And so I'm fine with getting on planes at this point. I hear you, man. No, absolutely. And I, we're all, you know, locked down, stir crazy and stuff. We need to see each other again. I, uh, I'll be at C2E2 uh, end of March, the first uh, weekend in April. I'm yeah. excited. I'm doing the ALA show oh, in nice. Chicago as well. And that's I a, love that That's show. a good show. Yeah. yeah. 
And it's interesting. I'm really, I mean, God bless the librarians, man. Yeah. Uh, who are only there for us and first yep. amendment rights and everything. It's man, they are being tested every, oh every, God. every other month. There's another graphic novel that some group hates. It's, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? It just, yeah. I've not seen anything like this in my lifetime. Mark, I know, man, we're like, we are close to the same age and yeah. I, I, maybe you felt the same way. I really felt we were kind of over the the giant uh, arguments about you know you to get the Westbury idiot, right exactly you know, exactly like you think you're West, you're Westbury Church, but you think that we're past a lot. Doesn't mean that it's all fixed. Doesn't mean that it's all better. But you think we're on the right track for most of our lives. You think we're on the right progression. As slow as it may be for some people, we're going in the right direction. And man, over the last six, seven years. It's just like we're suddenly skidding all over the highway. I know, man. Well, and I know you're on the front line and happy to uh, remind people of the First Amendment and that, hey, uh, I mean, God damn it. it used to, we used to make fun of this. Comics are for everybody, but right. they are. And it's yeah. that simple, man. And it's okay if you don't like a certain kind of comic and what it has to say, but um, that doesn't mean somebody else does. You know, Right, exactly. So and there's a lot of people, it's not about whether or not they like the comic. It's about whether or not they like the people who are going to read the comic. Sad but true, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Some uh, some great uh, – Roberts 100 right off the bat. says Right off the bat. Here we go. Can I just say Mark Wade has been hitting it out of the park in D.C.'s world's finest uh, – in D.C. In, uh, DC. World's finest has the feel that it should be. Yes, so you man. agree, man. Wait, and, and you were just telling me off the air. It's great. They really are letting you tell your stories your way. It's great. It's great to be home. It feels like being home. And it is it – is very. D.C. has been nothing but accommodating and just saying, what do you want to do? That's, you know, what, have you, what, what toys have you not played with yet? And I always knew that World's Finest was, you know, the Superman Batman book was the ultimate. That, would, that was always going to be like the goal, the long, you know, for 40 years. And now I've landed on it and I never leave in that book, man. You know, I'm, I'm trying to remember our, uh, our generation's favorite uh, creators for World's mm -hmm. Finest. I mean, Chris Swine always doing those great covers and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, writing wise, Alvin Schwartz, who was who was writing the bulk of that stuff. Schwartz was doing a lot of that stuff. Haney was doing a lot of that stuff. Leo Dorfman oh, sure. was doing a lot of that stuff. Uh, you know, would you say Boltanoff or? Uh, yeah, uh, no. Uh, um, after Haney, I suddenly I, now what did I blank? I blank. Who Haney? What did I say? Is it, oh what? Leo Dorfman. Leo Dorfman. Yeah. Leo yeah. Dorfman. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, and Haney doing a lot of that stuff and giving us stuff like the Super Sons or whatever, which yeah, made my head explode when I was a kid because it oh, didn't yeah. fit continuity. But now I, but these oh, are oh really? Things. Yeah, but these are. I was one of those kids. I was one of those like it doesn't fit the continuity. <laughs> and now I've learned, you know, that Bob Haney is an unsung genius. Well, and yeah, the rules didn't apply. And then you're smart. You set world's <laughs> finest like year one. Yeah, and we Just, get all these it, amazing stories. That was, the, I mean, that was the remit from DC, which was we want you to do a Superman Batman book that is classic in tone, and you get to use all the toys that you want. So don't feel, you know, beholden to to moment to the continuity of the moment, because then, you know, at that exact moment that I was going to take over the book, Superman was in space, and you know, Batman's living in downtown Gotham City. And you have no book if you have to play attention, if you have to play by the rules of continuity. So, you know, let me go back a little bit. But the, the tricky part of that book, the tricky part of that book is, is every story arc trying to engineer it so that it leads into something that is relevant to the DC universe today. Like with the first one leading into Lazarus Planet, with the second one with its big reveal about who Boy Thunder is. Yes. Uh, and... It's tricky to do that, but I think it's important if I can pull that off just because it, you know, it's so easy for some people to dismiss the book as, oh, it doesn't count because it because it doesn't happen in the here and now. Well, it's it's fiction. It counts if you like it. <laughs> I was kind of hoping that uh, when they set up the infinite frontier yeah. status quo, yeah. that if somebody had a great story of Superboy and Smallville, and there's Chief Parker, and there's Pete Ross, and yeah. you know the classic, the classic Silver Age setup. Fine, do it. And yeah. Black Label is sort of that. Um, but uh, but again, I think uh, like you know, thankfully, books like yours are showing you can you can still do that. But also, like you said, tie it to modern continuity. I right. think it's great, man. Um, yeah. yeah. But and also not make it a nostalgia trip just for to be a nostalgia trip. I mean, that's I could very easily do that too. I could very easily do you know Superboy and Smallville stories for the rest of my life, but. <laughs> But what audience am I playing to at that point? 
I'm what do I have to say about these characters that is still relevant and is revelatory? And is something, you know, what angle can I come at these characters at that you've never thought about them before? And if, it's easier to do that with a Superman Batman book than it is with, you know, like a, a Green Arrow book set in the 1950s or something like that. It just, it's so easy to, to just, you know, the, the orders my editors and Dan Moore, my artist have, are just do not let me become a nostalgia act. You know, the moment right. that happens, pull the plug. Just no. send me off on an ice flow. I hear you, bud. And and yeah. truly, and you did it at Marvel too. You do have new things to say about these characters, and that's the great thing. And also, here, Mike wants to know, we're mentioning Dan Mora. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, World's Finest is the most fun he's read in a long time. Was it your choice or Dan's to use the Michael Keaton bat symbol? It was Dan. Dan is just, Dan is astounding. He is, you know, he's young, and yet he he has a fondness for this older stuff not to the point where he's super familiar with it but what i like every time i send him reference on something whether it's a phantom zone projector or what i think boy thunder's costume should look like or whatever it's always with the caveat always with the caveat of this was taken from 1964 please make it look my do not feel beholden do anything this is just a starting point and what i will always get back is that exact same thing but it's somehow it looks modern He's just gifted that way. Well, Dan seems to be the right artist for this because, as you say, you're giving us the familiar. But I think Dan is Dan's art does put a, a new spin on it. And yeah. in fact, um, Ed Cato uh, yeah. says, "Oh man, loving these Mark yeah. Wade titles from DC. Just read and thoroughly enjoyed the World's Finest issue with that Supergirl Robin date. The old Super Sons bothered me too in the old days. There you go. Hilarious. Um, I want to know mentioning art." And yeah. this might be more of an artist question, but it seems to me a lot of events and new mm -hmm. books, uh, a phrase that I've learned in the last 10 years was toy etic. And does that ever come up in conversation with you to make a story where, God, you know, Mark, not only is this a great story, but obviously we can make a toy out of this as well. Not exactly, but it is not discouraged. Like, it, you know, sure. I guarantee that that Superman, Batman fusion character was in Todd McFarlane's hands before that book even saw print. And that wasn't me. It was just the editors looking at it going, holy cow, this should be a toy. So no one's, no one is specifically asking me to generate that stuff. But at the same time, if I can do it, that's a value add. Sure. And I just wonder if it's in your mind at all. No. Of, okay. Cause you know, like I think uh, one of the things metal, the metal event, yeah. Want so many toys, Batman oh, yeah. crafts, all these different iterations of the Justice League and everything. And I even remember an event that didn't happen, and that was they were going to take the idea of the composite Superman Batman and throw it throughout the league, and you'd have right. these grotesque happen right. things. And it's like, oh, those would have made a bunch those of those really perfect toys. toys, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, but that's not in your mind at all when you're it's, when you're it's not it. really. And part of that is because I have enough toys. I have more than enough toys to last me the rest of my life. I'm hip. No, no, I get it. But yeah, you know, and you know, too, they make more money from licensing and making the toys. Oh, yeah. Than they do from the comics and everything. So, exactly. You know. There, I mean, there, and I, you know, I can't speak to specifics, but I, you know, there are certain books at both companies that in Marvel and DC that, you know, are kept afloat in part because they have that, as you say, toyetic angle to them. The questions are coming in fast and furious. Uh, if, if Jack, yeah. how did you think of uh, using the devil Neza as the villain? I wanted to I wanted to come up with somebody new for the first arc. And what I generally do if I'm looking for a villain of any sort of like cosmic power level or, or godlike power level is I get, get, just go through other mythologies. I just do a deep dive through Egyptian mythology, Indian mythology, you know, Hindu mythology, whatever. And I found the, you know, the devil Neza in there and was able to extrapolate a story out of it. What worked to our advantage beautifully was that I didn't realize that Gene Yang was doing exactly the same thing with Monkey Prince on the other, you know, just over there. Sure. And so as he noticed this, he writes to us and says, hey, it's a funny thing. And so suddenly we had a connection. It turned, you know, it was an accident. It was coincidence, but we turned it into opportunity by making it then, you know, play off of both books and that all feeding into Lazarus Planet. 
That's fantastic. Yeah, I want to get into Nazareth's, Nazareth's Planet as well. I'll tell you, one of my favorite moments in uh, World's Finest early on was uh, the Superman with the kryptonite bullet and uh, and Dr. Niles Calder having to do the operation to uh, remove it and everything. That was fantastic. Thanks. And I, was, I and I love I love the Doom Patrol. I love classic Doom Patrol. And it really was a great opportunity to show them at their best. And just the weirdness of them rubbing right. up against Superman and Batman. Well, that's part of why that's part of how I pick the villains and the guest stars too. Is I, I there's never been a Batman Doom Patrol story as near as I can remember. So let's do that. Let's you know, let's show you Superman encountering a villain he's never encountered before. Let's show you Superman and Batman in a place they've never been to before. That's the fun of it for me. That sounds great, man. Uh, oh god, if Tom Account wants to know, mm -hmm. and uh, you had such a great run with Barry Kitson, any chance we might see a Legion relaunch? That's a tough one. That's a really tough one because I think that what Bendis did to remake the Legion to be a lot more inclusive was from from a from a conscience level and a and a you know a storytelling level a good choice, right? I think that you know I'm, I whether or not you like what he did, whether you like the stories or not. The idea of making the Legion sort of remaking them in the with a lot more diversity to them was, I think, a well-intended idea. And therefore, there's no way to do an older Legion story now. There's just not, because you don't want to do that and be accused of sweeping what Bendis did under the rug. Right? Yeah. Yes, that's the problem with the Legion. It's yeah. always on a constant sliding scale. Yeah. And and whether it's an event that happens in the here and now right. that it changes things or, you know, again, people just want to put their spin and uh, I don't blame you. No, man. And really, God, uh, we we're just talking off the air. I was telling you about Terrificon yeah. and I finally met Barry Kitson at one a couple of years ago. And I and it really it was great. It was just uh, Ordway and uh, Brett Blevings and and, yeah. uh, and Barry. And, you know, and he's just going down the list. And I've known Ordway, Ordway for a couple of years. I'm like, oh, Jerry, whatever. Spread Blevings, nice to meet you. And he's like, Barry Kitson. I'm like, Barry Kitson, listen, <laughs> everything you've done with Mark Wayne has been among my favorite comics. A, and Brett's like, hey. Talented man. Right yeah. here, man. Doomsday. Yeah. What are you doing? I'm like, listen, <laughs> I know, man. But I'm sorry. This is my first time I've ever met Barry. I was so yeah. excited. I love that guy. Great, great art. Beautiful fucking art. I'm so with you. Oh, good, Kenneth. See, hey, by the way, everybody, I got the banner down there. Do me a favor. Hit subscribe, hit the like button. I'm very lucky that people mar like Mark always come back, and it always means a lot to me. But it only helps the YouTube channel if you subscribe and hit the like button. So I see a lot of new people here, inclu including uh, Kenneth Crowley Jr., yeah. who says, I know I don't know if Mark has been asked about this yet, but what is your opinion of the CWDC shows and Superman and Lois? And also, what did you think of the ending of Stargirl? I really like all those shows. I mean, some of that is just because they exist. That alone makes them cool to me um i didn't i didn't watch all of the cw dc shows faithfully to the end i think i league you know legends of tomorrow sort of lost me once we replaced pretty much all the existing dc characters with new stuff which is it's fine but it wasn't those weren't my characters right those aren't the ones that i have an attachment to but you know flash i'm i'm into the bitter end uh it's and superman and lois surprises me at how much I enjoy that because it on, at first blush I look at it that's that's not what I would do with Superman but given that that's what they're going to do I think they've done a really good job with it I think he's I think he's grown into the role I think Tyler's grown into the role um I think the kids are great um I it's a good show and Stargirl I thought Stargirl was a home run the whole way through if not if n for no other reason than because they're wearing these costumes that look like mid-level cosplay as they walk around town and no one makes a thing of it, which I think is great. Like they're not the object of ridicule because they're wearing these, these costumes that look like they came from the 1975 comic art costume contest. Uh, again, I, well done. I, I'm so sorry that didn't make it to a fourth season. Me too, man. Absolutely. And I agree with you on Superman and Lois. Yeah. Uh, when I, but, when I, when it was yeah. first running, I immediately went out and bought. I only remember from the eighty-page giant originally, yeah. but I found the twelve-cent imaginary story with the original uh, Jor L Jr. and Cal L Jr. Yeah, Superman and... one sixty-six. Come on, you don't. You got to. You can try harder than that if you're going to try to stump me. Um, the <laughs> I will say too, 
of all of these shows, Doom Patrol is by far the, the most enjoyable, the most fun. I never thought in a million years I would get to see Gargwax and Monster Mala on my TV screen, and it's been delightful. And I'm, I'm really excited, De Dennis Culver, even before his Lazarus Planet preview came out, yeah. uh, sent me his 10-page story. And very excited for his uh, full-fledged yeah. run, if it's happening. I don't know if they've announced it. I think yet. it is. Yeah, yeah. All right. Good deal. Good deal. Uh, oh, Stanley. Uh, mm -hmm. This is interesting. And, of course, uh, Alex Ross, one of the fine sponsors of Ward Balloon. Mm -hmm. Would you ever want to work with Alex again? Sure. Sure. I mean, the one thing I wouldn't want to do is a Kingdom Come sequel of any kind because – it, we, you and I have talked about this before, John. It, that's just the, a recipe for disaster because people are going to compare you not to what the story was, but what their memory of the nostalgia of the great feeling that the story is. And then you're going to lose no matter what. So, but sure. I mean, Alex is insanely talented. Alex is the f only person in the world other than Tom Pyre I can have a half hour conversation about Martian Manhunter with. Yes. I'm here for you too, bud. You know, in fact, I want to <laughs> yeah. say, as far as testing your knowledge on books, and I we might have mentioned it in the last interview, but uh, we were talking off the air about the Kingdom Come table read that we did. But then I had a similar experience at Terrificon in Connecticut, where it was Maria who played Hawk Girl and George Newbern. And I was struggling. And I'm like, there's got to be a Superman Hawk Girl. Because first I combed through the Justice League cartoon, and there are no meaningful scenes between them the way there are in Kingdom Come and so many other character moments. So I'm like, Mark, there's got to be a Superman Hot Girl uh, comic book. And, of course, your response was? Boom. DC Comics presents 37. Come on. What am I? <laughs> what, what, was this amateur hour? Yes. <laughs> so I had my scene, and it was written by Jim Starlin, yep. which is even better. And I'm like, oh, this is great. And, they're, and literally, they look at the script, and they're like, what is this? And I'm like... <laughs> 1980s comic kids, don't worry. I go, this is we got yeah. you. I go, me and Wade have you covered. It's great. So that's fantastic. Okay, let's see here. Um, great call on Kingdom Come sequel. Yes, yes. I, I meant to ask you, yeah. um, and because I, I didn't keep my original issues, shame on me. I'm sure they'd be worth a lot of money right now, but I, and it's part of the trade. The coda at Planet Krypton mm -hmm. was that for the trade or was that in the original issue? No, that was for the trade. In point of fact, let me rewind. Before there was a trade, Graffiti was doing a special edition, like a special collection before DC did a collection. And wow. so, and that was that upscale hardcover with the signed book plates and so forth. And the request came in, I want to say from Bob Chapman, who, you know, Graffiti going, can we do something to goose this thing up? It's a great scene. And it, it my one of my favorite Batman Superman exchanges, Alex's art, given the expressions on their faces as they're talking about it. And, uh, you know, uh, Superman, hey, how's Luther doing? Uh, he tried to hack into the back computer the other day. I caught him in the back end. And it's like, he sends his regards. And that great farm boy looked like, really? <laughs> and I'm like, no, no. dumbass. Once again, yes. you you naive fuck. It's, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm saying fuck, but yeah. yeah it really, it was kind of an excuse just to spend an entire story in Planet Krypton, which, you know, was easy for Alex to draw and paint because all I did was walk around my apartment and take pictures. Outstanding. I was gonna say all the all the iconography, all the all the totems and stuff. Oh yeah, so that's, that's a, stuff from my stuff in my living room. Yeah. Do you have a wall of the Hawkman uh, uh you know uh masks, the various Hawkman masks? I do that? not, but I have a I have a wall of Batman masks. I should next time I'll show you the, the oh, case. Wow. Yeah, yeah. All right, Mark, I'm gonna zoom in. It's, yeah, it's an iconic painting and you're oh, a yeah. copy of it. But who who did paint the, the famous Superman? It's a painting by a gentleman named H. J. Ward, who was a pulp painter from the 30s and 40s. And he originally did this painting for the DC offices, uh, much bigger, like twice the size. It was kept the DC offices for years. It was done way early on in Superman's career and therefore in Superman's publishing career, whatever. So it wasn't bang on solid, exact. So a few years later, Stan Kay, who was an anchor and artist in DC Comics, also a painter, came along and touched it up and turned it into what this is now. And these prints are impossible to find. I there's, bet. Yeah, there's crappy prints that people are putting out there on eBay. But in 1974, a studio did a bunch of, you know, nice poster size, really nice prints. And they are a devil to come by. So if the place catches fire, that's one of the things that's coming out with me. <laughs> was that in 74? Was that contemporary with the Treasury Edition that had that as the cover? Yeah. Yeah. Right about that same time. Yep. 
that's uh, obviously that was my first exposure to it. Yeah. And my dollar was uh, in my hot little 10 year old hand. I'm that's like, just a yeah, great image. It's take my money. Image. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Oh, I should mention mentioning uh, Treasury Editions. Atomic Hound wants to know, will we see Black Adam in uh, in your Shazam run? Uh, not immediately, but yeah. Yeah, it's it's tricky because the tone of Shazam is going to be a little less superheroic and a little more impulse, if you will. Okay. Um, and so that, you know, tonally, you, you, you know, Black Adam is such a serious, dark character that when I bring him on stage, it has to be the right context. So I want to set up the world first, get you used to the idea of a world with talking tigers and talking dinosaurs and whatever else. And then, then we will hit you over the head with the dark stuff. Yes. Um, and then forgive me if this is uh, diving too far into it, no. but will it just be Billy, Mary? Will it, will it, will it reflect the movies? Is it going to have uh, the, the kids that have appeared in the other movies? And it will eventually the, again, the, the request from DC was let's, you know, get back to classic Shazam and, and, and his immediate, I have no issue with the kids. I think that's right. But the, my issue, my only problem was when I take on a series and you saw this with Flash and you saw this with Doctor Strange and you've seen this with other things that I take on, my my tendency is to kind of you know uh, stiff arm the supporting cast for a few issues while I get used to the main character and the immediate milieu and, and really drill down. And once I'm comfortable with that, then, you know, issues two, three, four, yeah, we'll bring the kids in. They don't have powers right now as a result of Lazarus planet right now, it's only Billy who's got the powers. Mary has her own powers, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, but Billy is going to be looking for a way. Billy is aware that this is a problem. He's aware that this is something he wants to be able to share his powers and has got to figure out a way to do it, but it's not. So we're not forgetting the kids, but it is, it's something that Billy knows he has to deal with soon. Okay. Caesar wants to know how Billy can be both a child in world's finest and in modern day. I kind of suspect the answer to that, but go ahead. I mean, world's finest is not set like 10 years ago. You know, it's, it's a few years back. There's still some spread there, you know, 12 to 16 or so. Well, and unlike kingdom come, which was the great surprise yeah. of it being adult Billy rather than Marvel under Luther, Luther's control. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like Billy really needs to be a teenager. Right, I think, or or you know, or or at least an adolescent, an adolescent to a teenager, because that's 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 the trick, and that's the fun, and that was the original fun, and I, I think I I don't know, have you ever envisioned doing Beyond Kingdom Come, like what kind of life Billy Bats an adult would have? I think he kind of disappears. No, I mean it, it doesn't it doesn't interest me at all because, like you said, that's that's what makes this, the whole concept magical, no pun intended. Um, yeah. I will throw this out, and this is just off the top of my head. I've never thought about this before, but you can make an argument that Billy ages slower than most people because he's constantly transforming into Captain Marvel, uh, Shazam, whatever his name sure. is. Sure. Yes. I, I loved in Jeff's uh, JSA run when he had the romance with uh, Star Girl. Billy yeah. did, and you know, and and of course, Marvel's uh, is Billy, so he has the same feelings. And Jake Garrett's like, hey. Little girl, what the hell are you? Th I'm seeing <laughs> yeah. look between yeah. you, and it was awesome because it's fair on Jay's part to say that to Marvel, but yeah. then again, it's like you know, it's brilliant. It's like yes, but I'm I'm, and then that that broke him up, and oh, heartbreaking, man. Love I that. Say, I will give you this other piece too, which is that I'm going to going to make a little bit of a different, a slight differentiation between Billy and Cap. They're still the same mind. They're still having the same thought. They're still they're they're still the same person, really. But what we tend to forget in the movies, as much as I love the movies, have completely forgotten this. He has the wisdom of Solomon. He has the wisdom of Solomon, so he shouldn't be thinking exactly the same way as in his superhero identity as he does as Billy. There should be something different about the thought process. Something about the clarity that he gets on crises and situations or what have you on how to deal with problems if you're, if you're, you know, in your superhero form. And so that's a little something we're playing with. Fair enough. All right. Mike Jones wants to know, might we see Batgirl in uh, World's Finest? You see her briefly in issue 13, uh, and we will bring her back because he, Batgirl is on Dan Moore's short list of 
characters that he really, really, really wants to draw. That's cool. I really want you to dig deep, man. And uh, I don't know. Well, oh, my list, my list is 30 pages long. I have no doubt. You see, this yeah. is great. Man. I want Ultra the Multi Alien to find a reason to show up and someday, yes. Johnny Double and, you know, Roy yeah. Raymond and people like that, man. No, I hear you. That's we got, Metam- we got a Metamorpho and the Metal Man showing up in the next arc. So outstanding. I love Metamorpho. Jeez. Yeah. I love what, uh, what Tom's doing in uh, Danger Street. Yeah. Were you like me? Did you buy all those first issue specials? I certainly oh, did. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every one of them, even the even code name Assassin, which is, by the way, the worst code name for an assassin imaginable. <laughs> Kind of does, uh, yeah, yeah. Lifts, uh, lifts the secret out. It, it really, it really uh, only works if he's not an assassin. It only, <laughs> only works if he's like a janitor. I was gonna say that's the janitor. He cleans up every yeah. night at the bureau. Yeah. I can appreciate that. Oh, Comic Boom, how you doing, Comic Boom? Of hey. all the new characters in, uh, introduced in the Lazarus Planet one shots, which is your favorite? Oh, good one, good one. Um, I'm not sure Dreamer counts because I want. I don't know if Dreamer premiered in this or whether she showed up someplace else first. If not, Dreamer. Then City Boy. I think City Boy actually has some real potential. I like City Boy. That's excellent. Yeah. Talk about Lazarus Planet, man, because yeah. you've certainly been involved with events before. Is this this? I'm trying to remember. You did like our. You did one of the other events previous it, beyond 52. Obviously. It's been a million. None of your readers, none of your listeners were born yet. I Armageddon was in 2000. Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, Underworld. Underworld oh, nice. That was, I think, the last time I took a swing at this, other than the Silver Age event, which nobody had paid any attention to, and for some reason has been buried to the in the graveyard graveyard of history. But yeah, it's been a while, and it it's fun because this is, you know, I I know what it's like to be on the other side of the table, right? I know what it's like to be told, "Hey, guess what? You're crossing over into this year, this event, and here's six things you got to do, and here's twelve things you got to accomplish." And here's your story. And that's no fun for a writer. So with Lazarus Planet, the whole point of doing the crossovers was to give the writers as few restrictions and rules and, you know, goals as possible. It's just it's magic. Anything can happen. Go nuts. Have fun. Go wild. And they really did. And uh, and now this, yeah, this is being the catalyst now for a bunch of new titles and, yeah. and reviving people and stuff. Uh, you know, no, I think I think it's been a great event. And what have you, what else have you learned uh, doing events now as opposed to the the previous swings? That they're really hard. <laughs> yeah, amen, son. Absolutely. It's, it's the the hardest part is that for them to have any real punch, you you you've got to throw everything in the kitchen sink included into that book. You've got you can't have a big giant crossover event that culminates in two people fighting it just got to be like you got to here's all the magic characters and here's all the justice league and bring all those guys in and that is that sounds good when i do an outline and when i sit down and actually write the pages my head explodes because choreographing all of that and making sure everybody has a line of dialogue and making sure zatanna has something to do as well as john constantine as well as superboy as well as robin it it is it is a choreographic nightmare but at the end of the day, and that's why, you know, you've got a lot of spear carriers in Lazarus Planet. That's why you've got a lot of magicians just kind of standing around the background going, hey, I'm the, I'm the demon. I'll, you know, I'll be here if you need me. That's outstanding. Absolutely, man. And also uh, new opportunities to collaborate with new people as far as the mm-hmm. handoffs and stuff. Look, it's uh, that Lazarus Planet book. I, when they showed me the art, Right, and they show me the, the who they wanted to do the book. I was skeptical, not because I didn't like the work. I thought the work was really good, but it's a very painterly, very dark style, and I've never worked with anyone in that style before. I tend to gravitate toward, you know, cleaner, more classic lines and and cleaner, more classic storytelling. But I, you know, there's no doubt I'm, you know, very talented man, and so getting to work with that and, and thinking in that head and really sort of thinking about, okay, what does he do really well that we can, that, you know, that I can lean into, what can I do to help him tell his best version of the story? It, yeah, I, I, every collaboration is different, but this one was far and away the most different for a long time. Fair enough. Uh, Ian Bruno wants to know, uh, will any Justice Society members um, uh, show up in World's Finest? 
You don't sooner, have to. You don't have to name call if you just want to. I, yeah, it. sooner than later. Um, okay. Yeah, because I do love the fact that Alan Scott and Batman and Wildcat were all running around Gotham City and stuff, yeah. and likely were inspiring young Bruce Wayne and, and things like that. Uh, you know, and I and I love the JSA. I love what Jeff's doing with the JSA right now too. Yeah, the different time periods. Yeah, I think that's a real a, a story opportunity. Yeah, to, to get into some other interesting things. So, uh, Bo Smith watching. Hey, Bo, how are hey, you? Hey, Bo, how you doing, man? Join the deep dives in the honesty. Very nice. I'm I'm all about the honesty. You know it this. Is. Yes, full disclosure always for with Mark Wade. Always, whether, whether it hurts us or not, and I and I got no <laughs> problem with that. Uh, if feel free. Um, this is interesting, although I, I kind of agree with what DC is doing right now. Mm -hmm. Tom McCown wants to know any chance you'll be involved in bringing back the Justice League. We've not, I can't say, but don't quote me. How about that? Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I know that there are plans to do something, and I know kind of what those plans are, and I approve of those plans. I think those, I think they're good plans. I listen, I and as as with Mark as well, we love the Justice League. I gotta say, give him a rest for a while, man. I mean, I really think. <laughs> Dark, dark uh, crisis was really uh, an opportunity to let the the second tier, the legacy characters, step yeah. up, and I think that's great because they needed the proper excuse yeah. to yeah. do it. And I love that. I think it was in Tom Taylor's Nightwing, yeah. the conversation between Bruce and Dick, and it's like, no man, this is your time. Yes, step this up. Was, you, you've been this, ready for this forever. Go ahead. We've been, you know, DC's been looking for a way to relaunch the Titans as as a premier book as they should have been and have been and, you know, deserve to be. And what a great opportunity. What a, it just, I don't think this was the original dark crisis plan, but I think it turned out this way as they went, Hey, we can do, if we retire the justice league for however long, then the spotlight has to go on the Titans and we can do something big with that. And they are those Tom Taylor's knocking out of the park with all the Nightwing stuff and the Titan stuff. He's terrific. I so agree with you, man. Absolutely. I'm. Uh, we've been trying to pin down, you know, between Australia and here, the the right time for us to do a new word balloon. He's a, he's another guy that's always yeah. good and comes back. Oh, Wayne, you know, we already covered up the possibility. Well, actually, I don't know if we did. I'll I'll put it up there. Any future plans to work with Barry on on specifically Empire? What a great story you guys do. Thanks. He's he's got a plot. <laughs> he's he's got a plot. He's been sitting on it for a while. Um, and. You know, yes, eventually we've had we've had plans for a long time. It's just for whatever reason, much like me and Alex Ross, the you know, the the, the worlds just don't seem to collide as often as they ought to. Everything stars don't get in alignment as much as they ought to. Franco is watching as well. Franco, how are mm -hmm. you, man? Love your Justice League as I gushed about your own story uh, to you over dinner that one night. Well, it's been the more than you. one night, man. Come on. Absolutely. I, uh, Franco and, uh, and Wayne and those guys, uh, we're going to do a, a Trek watch show, uh, talking about, uh, Picard ah. when, when you and I are done, but uh, that's later tonight, much later right. tonight. Uh, D Ho Holier. Mm -hmm. Love your work, Mark. Two questions. Have you figured out how to write Wonder Woman or is it just not a character you want to do? Interesting. Mm -hmm. And do you have non-powered character combos in the works? All right. Question one. No, I have yet. I've not yet figured out how to write Wonder Woman. Well, what about Kingdom Come? It's it's a version of Wonder Woman. I think that that's an aspect of her that I made work for the story. But if you said, "Hey, Mark, you're taking over the monthly," I, my head would explode. I don't, I don't, I don't know what in the world I would do. Okay, it's you know, I, I just I'm a science guy, and this is all myth. This is all mythology and magic, and that does not where my head goes. Um, and that said, there's also. There's also the X factor. There's the, we, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this too before, is that with all of these characters that have been around 40, 50, 60, 70 years, there are reasons they've been around and have survived when others haven't. And we think we know the reasons, but we don't always know the reasons. If we knew the reason, then we know the formula and we'd be able to create characters every day that are going to last for 70 years. We don't do that. With Wonder Woman, there's no doubt in my mind that the the weird sort of bondage, sexuality, feminist, early, like proto-feminist stuff that was in that series the first 10 years or so, there's no question that that was a part of what made that character successful and made it work. Because once they stripped all that stuff out, 
when when Marston passed away and Bob Cantor came and take on took on the book, it was never the same, and it's never been the same since then. It, they've had great periods. There's been really good runs of Wonder Woman with Gail Simone and, and others, but you, I don't know that you can really hit all the notes of that character without figuring out some way to make that work from a 21st century perspective, and I am not the person to do that. You know, I, I remember when you and Rucka did, uh, it was Spider-Man, Daredevil, and Punisher. Yeah. And that kind of, for a minute, maybe intimidated you, the idea of writing Frank. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. you know, Mark Mark held your hand, or uh, rather, uh, Greg held your hand. hand, and, hand yeah. 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 You know, so did you feel like you got a better handle on things from that uh, that crossover? Or it, no, Glad Gurig was my wingman on that. No, he was my wingman on that. I just don't, again, I'm I'm... I'm not averse to writing those kind of characters. I just have to be able to understand them. And I'm interested in understanding them and I'm interested in trying to deep dive, but boy, just sometimes you just can't, it, you know, it's like any, it's like any two people, right? Sometimes you connect, sometimes you don't. I thought you guys connected. I thought it was a great story, man. Yeah. I, really I mean, in, I'm in me and Frank, but yes. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Yeah. yeah me and Frank cancel. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hey, Nick Barucci is why I've been, everybody in comics is watching us, man. That's great. So, uh, uh, he says having you on is fantastic, and hit the uh, hit the like button and the like and uh, subscribe. You absolutely, bet. man. No, I appreciate it, everybody. Thank you. Uh, let's see here, Gonzalo Couto. Yeah. Didn't Adam Hughes explain Mark's to Mark what Wonder Woman is all about? Did he? We've had some good conversations. Um, I don't remember all of them, but Adam Adam is one of the smartest guys in comics, and no one knows this. Nobody thinks he's stupid, but I mean, nobody understands how smart Adam is. No one understands how quick he is and how witty he is. But more to the point, he's a thinker. And it you got to You're sitting there for 12 hours working on one illustration. You know, you got to be thinking about this stuff. And he does. And we've had some great conversations about Superman. We've had some great conversations about all these different characters over the years. And if I, you know, if I were to put together my brain trust, that's a guy I'd have on board instantly. Fair enough. The actual Dracula watching us. Good evening. Well, it's sundown, so I'm glad you could join us, Dracula. Yes. Uh, that, that, that certainly means a lot. All right. Man, questions are coming in so fast. Here we Good. go. Ian, Ian Bruno, do you think we might ever revisit Walter West, the Dark Flash, or did you think he received his final say after leaving Earth Prime? Boy, there's a deep dive for you. I think he, I think he's I think I've done my I think I've signed that off. I think that I think that, that sign off he got was the right one for him. Okay, I can appreciate that. Uh, well, as we all, you know, if Mark, if uh, Art Balthazar was would here, he would say, of course, you're you're one of the best Flash artists ever. Of course, so, of all time. You gotta got gotta point that out. Uh, Zach Goyette, yeah. I was talking to, uh, about this uh, earlier. Which character do you think should be elevated to the next level of the Trinity? It's not a Trinity anymore; it's a quadrangle. But in his opinion, it should have been the Flash, and feels like he's about to go there. I think if you have someone starring in a Flash movie who's not having mental problems, I think that that is what it takes to do it. <laughs> I think that I, you know, I, I, I hear you, man. You know, think, it's yeah, it's too bad because I really think of of all the Arrowverse heroes. No mm -hmm. disrespect to the others, but really, I really think Grant Gustin really channeled oh, yeah. Barry the best. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, 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 and also, by the way, what an accomplishment. We had 10 years of Smallville and then 10 years of the Arrowverse. Yeah. Nothing to sneeze at, man. And, and no, I also no, think. You, yeah, you and I were watching crappy Spider Man shows when we were kids with Nicholas Hammond. So, and we were, <laughs> we were glad to have him. Exactly. I know we're like Dana Carvey when he is the old man. We loved him. Yeah, we exactly. did the, the roasts of the superheroes and stuff. But, Great. Yeah. Jeff Altman as the Weather the next, Wizard. Yeah, Fine. The next but that next level of Trinity, I you know, I mean, Flash or Green Lantern would seem to be the the logical candidates, and I, you know, one of them once one of them has a blockbuster movie. Here's the thing. Here's what people forget, and I was talking to somebody about it this weekend. We talk about the Trinity, but I'm I'm not sure that there was a Trinity until Alex said, "Let's use Wonder Woman in Kingdom Come," and I will give him a lot of credit for wow. leveling that character up. Um, and then before that, everybody also forgets that Batman was not DC's flagship character in the 70s and 80s. He just flatly wasn't. No one cared about that. It was, there is a, a famous memo, and I will not name names, 
but after crisis, the DC editors got together while crisis is going on, realizing this is going to be a huge blockbuster for them. And the edict came down from on high. Every editorial department put down some some ideas. Give us some ideas as what we should do for crisis too. And I've got the list. Some of them ideas. Some of the ideas are interesting. Some of them are, are complete batshit crazy. Uh, but one of them is talking about how there's a character at DC who's really underserved and it's because they got no powers and nobody really takes them seriously and they're not that popular. It's time to give Batman superpowers. It's time to give him the power of flight. And the, the suggestion was dead serious and it sounds ridiculous to us now. And it was not unridiculous then, but it was less ridiculous because you know this too. You go from Neil Adams and Denny O'Neill in the early 70s. Then you go to uh, Englehart and Rogers in like 77, 78. And then you go to Frank Miller in 86. And then you have nothing, nothing in between. You have no good Batman stories for 15 years. And he just was not a flagship character. Once you took, once the TV show was over in 1968, you know, he just became yet another DC character like Flash and Green Lantern. It wasn't until Frank and it wasn't until Michael Keaton that that character became a flagship DC character and will obviously continue to be the flagship character until we are dead and gone. That's I don't know where I was going with this. But oh, so, wow. so, anyway, so, so, the, so the idea of a trinity is kind of a slow build, if you will. All right. That's so funny. Of course, Caesar Rome goes, hey, what about Alan Grant? Well, and I was going to say, man, Doug, Doug Munch is going to punch you in the face the next time. That's after. That's after. That's that would count. I'm talking. Well, about, Grant was after '89. You're right yeah. about that. Yeah, uh, I'm talking about Dave. I'm talking about the David V. Reed years. You know, I'm talking about John Colnan and Vince Coletta and Ernie Chan and you know people who really well intended, creative people who shouldn't be within a million miles of Batman. That's hilarious. Mark McGrath wants to know. Uh, will we see the challengers of the unknown? Because you're a science guy. Yes, yes. The trick with challengers. Tell me, because they are difficult. They are very difficult because if you remember, their whole shtick is the four of them are, they, they each have one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. One of them is a mountain climber. Another one is a deep sea diver. These things were very, very cutting edge in 1959. They do not fly today. You're right. These are There's not the most a boxer. And, and right. it was at the height of televised boxing and everything. You're right about right. that. Go on. These are exactly, they, you know, and then they, then they decided Rocky was a wrestler. Again, that's not the most dangerous profession in the world either. So you're stuck with either keeping them in that 1958 mentality or trying to figure out a way to tell stories with what are today the most dangerous jobs. And I defy anyone to come up with a challengers, the unknown story starring an ice road trucker and an coal Arctic fisher. Miner. Yeah. Yeah. Coal miner. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. That's Good hilarious, man. Yeah. Living on borrowed time. I, I yeah. love those. Again, it's a, it's a great, it's such a great concept. It's such a great, the, the tagline living on borrowed time. There's nothing not to love about these characters, except that they don't translate well into the 21st century. You're right about that. Do you ever have a chance to talk to Kirby about challengers specifically? I did not. I had a couple of good conversations with him over the years when I was a fan at conventions because he would talk to anybody. God bless him and thank him for that. Um, but no, I would love to have had that conversation. Oh, Michael Edson, or Elson, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Great uh, point. Thinking about Dwayne McDuffie since it's recently the anniversary of his passing. Yeah. Did yeah. you have a chance to work with him? Do you have any fond memories of Dwayne? Dwayne, man, sweetheart of a guy. I, I only oh, met a couple of times. But we had best. really nice conversations when we met. It was, I never got a chance to work with him, but and I didn't get a chance to know him well, but when we did have chances to sit down for meals, when we did have a chance to break bread or sit down at conventions or whatever, it was always delightful because we both had the same passionate love for this material. Um, and it was humbling because he's so much smarter than I was. So, so much smarter than I am. Oh, so that was- I'm not even for myself. He's smarter than me too. Smart, he did do arguably one of the smartest, just in terms of book learning, one of the smartest guys who ever worked in comics. And so, uh, you know, as long as he's around, I can't be the number one science guy. So um, anyway, that he you was, know, he was terrific. Yeah, he was, you know, and I love the fact that, and this is what was, 
prior to the internet, everybody, this is what uni was universal about comics. Mark, me, Dwayne, we all had three completely different backgrounds, but we're around that we were around the same age and we love the same stuff. Yeah. And that, that's what I gleaned from my conversations with Dwayne was, yeah. you know, just the, the, the great stuff that we all enjoyed and everything. So, uh, there we go. Oh, well, Mark has a suggestion for uh, challenges that the deep sea diver should now be an underwater fighter. <laughs> Sold. That's going to make for a good story too. Actually, Jeff Lemire did it, but I don't. <laughs> I didn't remember. I didn't. Well, yeah, the the underwater yeah. welder, of course. Yeah. Yes, I just talked to Lemire. That's awesome, yeah. man. That's so funny. Um, oh, here, our right, Barucci has a comment on the Batman uh, wasteland yeah. period. Uh, I agree with Mark on Batman. It's a shame because that Jerry Conway. Don Newton, Gene Colan stories. Those were good, but not enough fans read those books. First, uh, No Runa, Man Bat, no, so much more. Nocturna, he means, but yeah, oh, part, of course not. He's, he's not. He's not wrong. I mean, it's. Uh, I'm speaking oh, yeah. in general. I'm speaking in generalities when I when I mock that you era. Your, I, you I'm just your no name your guys. Theory. God bless them. Absolutely. <laughs> but he's not wrong. I mean, there's some. There's a lot of good stuff there. It doesn't. But it's not. Like it's not. It doesn't have the same reverence as you know Inglehart rogers there's you know there's a reason why that stuff is still remembered and still collected and still in trade paperback and will always be in print and yeah. their batman just does not have enough of those superman doesn't for the you know 70s and 80s either doesn't have a lot of those um oh good this is a good entree jeff uh jeff wants to know mm -hmm. how you would feel if james gunn wanted to use elements of birthright in superman legacy that he said you wrote was the okay. best uh, Superman origin he ever read. I certainly yeah, love uh, Birthright as well, and that's a great entree to ask you about James Gunn's slate and the projects. Yeah. Oh my god! I mean, I, I'm so over the moon at with what his plans are. I mean, I don't know any more than you do, but I do know that if he used elements of Birthright in his Superman stuff, I would wash his car every week for the rest of my life um, and be his personal assistant he's he loves the stuff and he loves it in a way that is respectful of it and he loves these characters in a way that you know respectful but also being willing to put your tongue in, in cheek i'm sure there are some people who are somehow offended by peacemaker and his take on peacemaker the, you know the nine people who are fans of peacemaker um <laughs> but he's i you know he's a smart storyteller you know, I love the Guardian stuff. I love the, the other work he's done. I, 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 I see big things, sir. I see big things in that man's future. Thank you, and I and absolutely, I agree with you, man. And and yeah, again, he's one of us. He gets it, and yeah. one of the few filmmakers, and like a Kevin, truly like Kevin Feige, that understands yeah. what makes these characters great, yeah. and the other opportunities to give us something. Familiar but different at the same time. Right. Just, um, just, just don't have them kill people. That's a very low bar. I set a very low bar, which is don't have them murder people. That's that's really all I ask. If you can do that, then I'm in. Um, Comic Boom wants to know what you thought of, and really, I want to expand on this just in general. Yeah. DC's uh, from New Fifty Two to currently. What yeah. do you think of Jam James Gunn referencing Tom King's Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, but also the way that Supergirl is now positioned that actually. She's the one who had the real Kryptonian life. And even yeah. though she's the teenager and Superman is the adult, she's a little more uh, uh, interplanetary-wise rather than world-wise yeah. because of her years on another world, unlike Superman. But, yeah, what do you think of all that? Yeah, Tom and I clearly have very similar ideas about, about her background. I, you know, I, I, digged in, I dug in this in the world's finest a little bit, too, which is that, you know, it's it's different. She She grew up a Kryptonian. She was you know, 15, 16 years old by the time she got rocketed into space. She she lost everyone she knows. She lost an entire planet and knew it. Like, it, you know, so did Superman, but Superman was an infant. He had no memory of this. Um, and so it does give her a different perspective, and it does make her a little, potentially a little, potentially a little harsher. I like her as a kind person. I, I like Supergirl when she's nice and she's kind, but that doesn't mean she has to be saccharine sweet. I was not convinced with super with Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow that I would like that take. And it took me an issue or two to sort of put aside my predisposition. And when I did, I really like what, what Tom had written. I think that was a really interesting take on the character. I agree with you, man. No, I, and I and also I love how much James is gushing 
about how much he loves Tom and that Tom is part of the uh, creative team, kind of the way the Marvel team worked with the early MCU movies and stuff. And it seems like, you know, James is uh, tapping Tom in that direction. I certainly hope he does it more. I'm so happy for Dan Jurgens and and uh, and what's uh, going on with um, with Booster. Yeah, you know, me too. I mean that's that is so good. And, and and don't you feel the same way? Like and and you and I again, we were we were there when Booster was brand new, yeah. and it's like Booster is more relevant than ever. He would <laughs> absolutely be on TikTok and, yes. and Instagram and and in front of that stupid pink wall in L.A. You know, holding up yeah. an energy drink and stuff. I don't I don't know that even Dan knew how prescient he was in 1986 when he came up with this, but it was, I, I knew there was something special. I met him for the first time at a convention when I was a fan in 1984 and I was in Dallas and it's a good convention. I met a lot of people during that time. This is how, by the way, this is how you break into comics. You, you work a convention as a, as a, you know, a volunteer and you're the guy who drives people back and forth from the airport. Ah. That is how you get into comics. Um, so I did a lot of that. And he, you know, we're at a bar and he was telling me all about this Booster Gold thing he was going to do. And it was, I knew, it was so unlike anything that DC was doing. I thought it was really smart. And it is so nice to see, you know, Dan finally, <laughs> I would say Dan get the attention he deserves. He did the death of Superman for Christ's sake. But of course. that the character get the, the attention he deserves. And, it, you know, can, can Impulse be far behind, James? That's all I, that's all I say. I'm for it, absolutely. And also, really, Mark, that generation before your generation, mm -hmm. where the pinnacle was working for DC, working for Marvel, mm -hmm. and I've made it. And now the game has changed so much. So much. That the opportunities are there to take those audiences with you and create new things. Yeah. And I'm just glad that I have no idea what plans, if any, Dan has for creator own stuff. But it is so nice to see, hey, man, Booster Gold is amazing. And uh, yeah, I mean, God, uh, uh, Sal Crivelli, a buddy of mine who is one of the comic pop uh, hosts, said, I want a, a cam." or no, it was Jason Inman. He's like, I want a cameo kind of like Ostrander in Suicide Squad. Sure. Or maybe Dan Jurgens is uh, Michael's boss in the future at the Space <laughs> And it's like, it's hey, cool quit thing. loafing around and get back to work. That would be great. I hope that happens for Dan. Dan, unlike many of us, is a telegenic human being. So sure. Uh, you win between me and me, uh, me, you, buddy, as far as faces for uh, TV rather than <laughs> radio. Don't sweat it, please. That's why you go to IHOP, man. There's always going to be somebody heavier than yeah. us walking into IHOP. Uh, Fresh News 24 7. Question for Mark How old were you when you wrote Kingdom Come and how old was Alex? Must have been early 20s. Very complex for such a young age. Oh, uh, I, yeah, yeah. You were so kind. You were, yeah, I must look much younger than I am. I, I, was, I was just on this side of 30 at that time uh alex was in his 20s so all of that about the complexity of it being pretty sophisticated for somebody in his 20s all that goes to alex yes excellent oh uh you know a couple people have asked and i'll put matt's comment up yeah. but um uh wanted to know uh if you are doing a superman book with brian hitch and another person was saying any updates mm -hmm. on that potential project it's it's yeah it's it's on it's just at this point, it's on me. At this point, it's it. Brian is waiting for a script from me, which never happens. That is not the way this is supposed to work. If I do it with Brian in that way, I'd only have to do a script every 18 months. And instead, he's turned into a speed demon. So now we're waiting on me. But I I can't imagine you're not going to see that sometime in 2023. Wow, that's great to hear, man. Excellent. No, I know uh, Hitch has been on and talked about how he's kind of reinvented his process to get faster. And that's great. It, yeah. It's interesting too. It's it, both of us are wrestling with the black label format. Both of us are wrestling with that magazine size, which oh, you, would, okay. you would think at first that this would be perfect for Hitch. Perfect because he's the widescreen guy, right? So give him more territory, more real estate on the page. But as we're talking, you know, he confessed to me a few weeks ago, he's like, I thought that was going to be it. And instead it's killing me because we have to just rethink and recalibrate everything we know instinctively about what fits on a page how to pace a story i'm you know i'm struggling with it a little bit he's clearly struggling with it it it's so funny it, it, it when you know when marvel and dc went from 22 pages to 20 at one point it it was the end of the world because it's it's so different it's it sounds ridiculous that two pages is going to make a huge difference but it once you're used to doing it's 
you know, once you're used to playing nine innings of a, of a game, right? Once you, if you're suddenly playing eight and that's the way it's going forward, it's just going to feel weird. And you're going to, everything you do is going to be different. The way you approach the, the way you approach the game is going to be different. Yes. Yes, absolutely. No, I can appreciate that uh, strategizing from that point, by the way. And, and Brian Hitch is kind of almost embarrassed by that solo Justice League run he had. The one kernel of that that I really appreciated and I found interesting was when he had Zod, um, yeah, Zod, not Zod, Rao as wow. the bad guy. Yeah. And a real, like, interesting exploration in Kryptonian religion. Like, yeah, I was, was, I was really jealous. I was really uh, jealous of that, and, yes. And truly, man, the, guy, the fact that you guys are working on Superman, it would seem to me, and again, I don't want to spoil anything, that that's a great opportunity for you to find another Superman collaborator yeah. that might have different ideas than than what you're bringing to the table. It was, I mean, he he signed on immediately. I mean, I sent him the pitch just because, you know, I maybe there's a chance he would, and he wrote, actually, he didn't even see the pitch. He heard what it was going to be. That's what he heard the basic log line from the editor and that he signed on right off that. So, because it really is, without disclosing too much, I mean, the whole story is really an excuse to do a, a travel log throughout the entire Superman universe. Now, so here's the 30th century and here's Atlantis and here's Candor. And so, and so this is a chance for him to do all of that stuff and exercise all those muscles. And he's having a ball. Excellent. I love that. Um, let's see. Greg wants to know, and this is good, good hypothetical, Greg. Yeah. Uh, what of your own work would you recommend to someone who has never read a comic book before? That is a great question. Um, I don't think it would be Kingdom Come. Um, yeah, I think, that needs a lot of back back knowledge. I Absolutely. think that's the day. It doesn't. It doesn't really, but it 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 doesn't really, but it feels like it does because there's so many characters on the page. Um, True. Yeah. But really, it's a story about generals. It's not a story about infantry. So it's not. So I, I, I don't think it does. But it certainly looks like it does. If you put this into somebody's hands who's never read comics before, their head's going to explode until they sort of get the rhythm of it. If if they can get into it, um, I might give them Daredevil. Good. I might give them Daredevil. I think that's that's grounded enough, where it's not super fantastical, and there's enough human emotion in it where I think. Yes. I mean, actually, here's the acid test. I, that's what I gave my fiance to to look at. The first thing I showed of, of mine. Hey, and congratulations, so, man. I didn't know you guys. Uh, that's good. Yeah. Are you, is that a, that's wonderful. Congratulations. I didn't Thanks. know that. Atta boy. Very good to hear, man. Oh, and Barucci says uh, they would give him uh, any of your fresh flash graphic novels or Superman Birthright. Well, Superman Birthright. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it, He huh. wins. Superman Birthright. Yeah. <laughs> it's certainly my favorite. It's certainly my favorite thing I ever wrote. We talked about it. You said, yeah. so. um, uh, Oh, let's see here. Oh, oh, Zach. Good question, Zach. Yeah. What were you doing during uh, Thrill Bent, your digital uh, uh, initiative, right. seven years ago? Uh, with what you were doing, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on the progress or lack of progress, depending on your point of view, of digital content now? Oh my god. Know? Oh my god. It's we we went the completely wrong way. Um, what we tried to do with Real Ben, and we just you you John Rogers, my partner, and I, you know, we were gonna get we're gonna get out of it what we put into it, and both of us are busy, and John's got a TV career and a movie career, and I've got all right. my stuff, and so as we started really realizing how big a, a task we'd taken on, life kept life keeps getting in the way, and so we just finally just couldn't make that thing sustain, but. For the time we had Thrillbent, for those who don't know, it was our digital uh, comics platform that we had created. And we were creating new ways of reading digital comics and new ways of using the format and, and getting away from this idea that digital comics are just a picture of a comic book. And there's stuff you can do that's not motion comics, that's cheap animation, but other ways of storytelling that you can, other things you can do only with the medium of, of desktop computers or, or laptop computers or, or tablets. Um, and we, I, 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 what's one of my big regrets is that I didn't put more time and energy into that to try to make it sustain because no one took that baton and I still think somebody could instead. What we have done is we have gone to the webtoons format, which is vertical scrolling, which is interesting in and of itself, but I, 
it's a weird format for comics. People don't realize I think you've, how weird it is. I mean, I say this as a creator. First off, the vertical scrolling, um, because you're looking at stuff on your phone, you know, this is not a Jack Kirby experience you're going to get, right? And you know, this is not very, it's not, first off, it's not very art friendly in that sense, uh, in terms of being able to do the big expansive stuff comics can do. More than that, it puts the text and the words at, uh, at a premium. It, 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 it emphasizes the text of a comic and the drawings are just ancillary because if you're vertically scrolling up, the first thing you're coming across is the balloons. The first thing you're coming across is the text and you're reading then and then you get to the picture and you're divorcing the relationship between art and words, which is what makes comic work, comics work. So all of these things make my head hurt. Uh, all that said, this is a supremely successful format and there's a reason for that. I just don't get it. And I don't think it's the best use of digital tools, but at this point, I'm just kind of railing from the sidelines. At this point, yeah. I, no longer have a, you know, I, no, I no longer have a, you know, a foot in the, what the, 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 the fist in the game. What's the phrase? What am I thinking? Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, skin in the game. Or, yeah, the game. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm yes. with you, man. Well, and I'll put it in astronaut terms, Mark. You were among the Mercury 7 yeah. that were exploring when, it, when digital comics were brand new. My fear was, and this was prior to the iPad being developed, mm -hmm. that we were only going to read digital comics here on the iPhone. And I'm like, well, doesn't that lose the impact yeah, yeah. of the splash page? Exactly what we were just yes. talking about with Hitch and Black Label. Yeah. And yeah, man, the money, where are the money shots? Thank God the pad, the pad came along. But I have to admit, and I read just as many digital as mm -hmm. uh, physical comics. Right. There is, even on the bigger screen of the iPad, mm -hmm. there is something missing from that wow moment that you still get from a physical book. There, there really is. I mean, I have, you know, I have all my stuff on the iPad at this point. And I love the fact that I can go anywhere in the world and pull up a random issue of all-star comics and read it. But, and, and, you know, I've got the, the pro, which is 12.1, 12.1 inches, right? Toward, uh, so that's the, or 12.9 screen, which is exactly, exactly to the millimeter, the size of a comic book, which is why that works for me. I don't know how people read comics on an iPad mini, it's like reading an old, you know, DC Digest or something. Um, but you're right. Even with that, it still is not the same. But I also don't have room in my house for 100,000 comics anymore. So I'll make that trade. I am so with you, man. Absolutely. Um, oh, uh, Tomb Raider wants to know, mm -hmm. and we haven't discussed this yet, uh, the Shazam to the mm -hmm. Captain name change. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that is that it, it is is Marvel now being referred to as the Captain? Yeah, I mean, casually in the comics. I mean, here's the thing. This is as you can imagine, as you know, uh, there is no there is no news happening or mention of anything in comics that CBR will not make into six different clickbait headlines. And so suddenly, this became a huge thing. It's like, no, what I'm saying is, within the context of the comic, he needs a name. That he can call himself. I don't. <laughs> Boom. I, 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 I know we, you know, in the past we've sort of hand. Let me give people some background. You know, people know why he can't. You know, he can't be called Captain Marvel. Most people understand that he can't be called Captain Marvel because Marvel now has that a lot on that name. Trademark. Yeah, yeah. But the reason you can't like just call him Captain Thunder or something like that and try to make that the official name is that that's not how merchandising works, right? Merchandising works because that character is going to be associated with the Shazam word forever. And if you're somebody looking for a toy, if you're somebody looking for a beach towel, if you're somebody looking to buy a, you know something for your significant other who loves comics or whatever, that is a name that, that resonates, right? Shazam. Uh, you're not going to see something marketed under captain thunder or whatever or even in this case the captain it's not like it's not like you're going to see a bunch of toys named the captain it's, it's too just retro man yeah it's it's too just, retro. It was, it's, it's it's as much of a tongue-in-cheek thing as anything but i just needed some reason for him to be able to say his own name in the comic i know we've hand waved away a little bit of that in the past with oh he can say his name as long as he's not thinking x y and z but no that that takes all the magic out of the word not not just literally but also symbolically it just takes I, all the sure you know, that's it, you. It, it's not a magic word if you can just if anybody can just say it. So 
That's awesome, man. I, I so agree. And uh, hell, man, we, as you know, uh, because our, of our love for Golden Age comics, we even had Captain Tootsie, who was yeah. the Tootsie Roll. Uh, the Tootsie uh, Roll yeah, mascot, yes. So, yeah, man. Oh, and that's, and by the way, I am so with uh, Mark and uh, Timur, who points out, Mark Wade throwing shade on clickbait comics. Oh, any, yeah, any time, any day. Too many times. Well, and, and Mark, I, that's an opportunity. And please, yeah. first you say your comment, and then I will ask my question regarding where comic uh, news is now as opposed to a couple decades ago. It's, 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 it's ghastly. I mean, there are sites that work. There are sites that I like. There's, you know, the beat is, is a site for stuff, you know, yeah, you, know, know um, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a lot of sites out there that, but, but too many of them. And we all know the main one I'm talking about is all about, you know, headlines that are James Gunn explains his plans for Supergirl. And then the article is, I think I want to do something with Supergirl. And then they'll make three other articles about it. And it's just, it, it's just, it's maddening and it's, it's reductive and it's exhausting and it's misrepresentative and it's just no fun to read. It just, you know, if, if everything's news, nothing is news. Right. I so agree. And Mark, honestly, and I'm sure I've told you this before, but if not, Things that you guys were doing because you were a big part of Amazing Heroes at Fanographics, yeah. Yeah. the Comics Journal, mm -hmm. David Anthony Crafts Comics Interview. Yep. All that stuff was the inspiration for me to do Word Balloon. Thank you. Because it's long form, mm -hmm. getting inside your guys and women's heads. Yes. What you want to do and what you're thinking about while you're making this stuff. And those were the best. And I still, sadly, will go on eBay and hunt down old amazing heroes or PDF oh, yeah. I still will sift through old yeah old comic interviews and stuff just the comic though journal yeah just even though I've read that stuff before it's fun to just go back and look at it years later and go okay this is what Bob Kaniger was thinking at the time yeah absolutely man oh this is all right and Michael I agree with you well listen there are parts of CBR that are still okay but I agree it is more top five lists and clickbaity stuff or a misleading headline that really goes nowhere, but he likes the beat. Uh, yeah. Pop verse is interesting. Pop -verse. Yeah. I, I, well, I salute pop verse. Yes. I'm, I'm comics journal. Certainly. Yeah. You know, uh, Oh God, here's a, <laughs> Greg, Greg says, maybe you should try Captain Komoda. Miracle man. That's fine. Yeah. You know, that's all. <laughs> Captain Komoda. Hilarious. Can yeah, I get so. a Captain Komoda lunchbox, please? Sure. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, this, well, you, this might be something that, uh, uh, maybe part of the story, Caesar. I don't know. But what are Freddie and Mary superhero names now? I don't want you to spoil yet. Uh, if there's a change, no, right? I can tell you. I mean, Mary, Mary superhero name is Mary Marvel, which is great. Someone, someone in legal is a fan, and someone in legal made it happen. So she's Mary Marvel now, and uh, Freddie's superhero name is Freddie Freeman Jr. because he doesn't have superpowers right now, right now, okay. yet. Well, yet. I'll be interested to hear because honestly. I mean, again, I, I love the old re reprints. So mm -hmm. when it was the 70s and 80s and he was Captain Marvel Jr., I didn't blink. But no. I can appreciate that that's another kind of awkward retro name. And I know for a while they were calling him CM3 or CM squared. Yeah, you're CM or whatever. Yeah, see, yeah. but it, and and it's hard. It's hard. I wouldn't, I you know, if, if we had the name Captain Marvel, I wouldn't hesitate to call him Captain Marvel Jr. But I don't know that you can call him, you know, you can't call him Captain Jr. I don't know. I don't know. We'll we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I hear you, man. Oh, thanks, Nick. Nick's got to run. Uh, great watching, right. and uh, really glad that we got Mark. Hey, man, he's happy that he got uh, you on the air. I agree. Always a uh, pleasure. Jesus. Well, likewise, buddy. You know that. Always uh, a pleasure to talk to Nick too. Keep him coming. I'm I'm here for a while. Keep him. Keep coming. All right. Fair enough, man. Uh, Kalai two thousand wants to know what your take is on other Kryptonian survivors. Mm -hmm. Candor, the Phantom Zoners. Does that take away? from the specialness of Superman as the last son of Krypton? Good question. Let me not put too fine a point on this. No. No, it doesn't. Um, I get it. You know, I, I, Soul Survivor of the Doom Planet Krypton is resonant and it has some weight to it when you put it that way, but there's, he can still be unique within you know, surrounded by people with it's because it's not about his superpowers. It's not about the fact that he can fly or has heat vision. It's the, it's who he is. And Supergirl is not that character. And Kandorian is not that character. And General Zod's not that character. And, uh, you know, yeah, you don't want too many Kryptonian survivors just hanging out all the time, but 
I, I don't think it makes him less special. I think that, if anything, it accentuates what makes him unique among them. He's still alone as opposed to those who grew up in the Kryptonian society yes. or even, even survived in the Phantom Zone. I agree with you. I thought that James Robinson and Greg, and I forget who else was collaborating on New Krypton from uh, the, the late uh, aughts, was yeah. a great series of, hey, look, man, now you get to experience that Kryptonian world. And it's like I'm a stranger in what yeah. I always felt was my home world. I and agree. it really it's I mean, I'm Greek. I imagine I would feel that way if I spend an extended period of time in Greece. That is much of yeah. my country, man. It's a different world. I don't I can't give it away, but there's a there's a really good scene in the first pitch story with Superman and Candor. And I think a different way of looking at that. I think it's a way that I came up with an angle on Superman and Candor and how he experiences that and how they experience him. That is something that we've never talked about before. It's something that we've never approached before. And, and yeah, I, that's it's funny. He's still, he's still unique. Philosopher King wants to know mm -hmm. what the process was of this new Captain Marvel series coming to fruition. Did DC editorial approach you? Did you approach them? They approached me. They just said, look, this is, you know, world's finest is so much fun. You do fun things. Let's do more fun comics. I want to see other, the other faucet heroes uh, popping in as well. I, Man and I don't, yeah, I don't know if there's much room for minute man, but yes, there's, you know, or I just <laughs> I golden arrow, but yes. Um, <laughs> no, some of them are fun. I, you know, and let's, yeah. let, let's see. I, and Dan Mora wants to draw them all. Dan, by the way, just to remind people, he's staying on world's finest and drawing Shazam at the same time. That's he so is, great insanely fast in here's a, here's a story so a few weeks ago he sends me as he does he'll, he'll send me and the editors will send them uh thumbnail breakdowns of his pages just to make sure the storytelling is clear and you know we're doing anything um so this is me a thumbnail breakdown of a page like thumbnails and again stick figures and it's a page with panels it's not like a one giant pinup shot he sends this at 806 in the morning I look at it immediately. I run him back at 8.20 in the morning saying, this page is awesome. This is great. At 10.16, that same morning, the finished inked page shows up in our email. This is how fast he is. He has children. He has a family. I don't understand how he manages to, to, to do all that and be a dad and do all this. And, and two hours. Kirby was not that fast. No. It's incredible. That's so great to hear, man. And again, yeah. Dan is such a high quality A list artist. So uh, I'm I'm really glad you guys are working together on oh, this and more. And I, I hope, with no disrespect to Dan, given uh, this creator's love of the uh, Shazam universe, mm -hmm. that Doc Shaner and you have a chance to collaborate. Anytime, I mean, anytime. That door is always open for Doc. The door door is always open for Somni. You know, that door is always open for a, a bunch of people who, you know, I mean. Somni, Mora, you know. Yeah, we want to see it back with Chris too. Yeah, these are all guys. Yeah, these are all guys who I will never let go very far. You know. Someone else had suggested uh, for a first read of one of your runs, your mm -hmm. Captain America run, and I so agree with that as well. Maybe something there. Um, there's also Potter's Field, which everybody forgets about. That was the procedural, uh, which I don't think is in print, sadly. Which we got to fix. I was going to ask Mark because was that Boom or was that Thrill Bent? That was Boom. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mark, are you are you still with Rebellion? Are you still uh, uh or no? Uh Rebellion or Humanoids I, or what? I meant human, I meant human. That's right. Not humanoid. No, I, I mean got great people, you know, worked as a publisher there for the for a few years. At the end of the day, I'm not an office guy. It just doesn't yeah, I, just, I enjoy my freedom. You know, but, it's like uh man, again, forgive everybody, uh, old fart reference, but it's uh -huh. kind of like when they made Ted Williams a baseball manager. And it's like, <laughs> oh, man, Ted Williams is a player. And, and I, he can't he can't he can't translate his yeah. talent to an employee. And I and I would imagine, I mean, you're Mark, you're a great, you are a great editor and you've had your turns at editing and stuff, but you are so it's uh it's Star Trek too when Spock tells Kirk it was a it was a mistake to assume or to accept promotion, commanding a starship is your first best destiny. It, that's just it. I mean, I'm a good teacher. I'm you know, and I think I was good at being a publisher, but at the same time, that's not you know, that's not my fastball. You know, that's not, it's not, every once in a while I'll take a, a gig like that with Boom or with them or with Cross Gen back in the day or whatever. 
because it's it's nice to be around other people. It's nice to, you know, on a creative level, not just writers talking to writers, but me talking to all aspects of yeah. uh, of the industry. And also, it keeps me it keeps me educated about all aspects of the industry. I mean, as you know, you know, I've done everything. I've done. I've owned a store. I mean, I've done. I you know, publisher, <laughs> editor you know, writer, artist, inker, colorist, letterer. I, I, I seek out these opportunities. I want to be able to say I've touched everything that you can do in comics. And so, and I want to be up on stuff. I want to know how publishing works in, you know, 2021 in a way that it didn't work last time I was in that seat 15 years earlier and what I can learn. And so all that stuff makes me better at my job. All that stuff makes me a better teacher. Uh, so I'm always in for that kind of experience. But yeah, at the end of the day, I'm at my best when I'm sitting here in my chair and my laptop and writing world's finest pages. That's where we want you, man. I yeah. know that there have been, there are other experienced creators that DC will pair with um, less experienced editors mm -hmm. to kind of help them through. And guys like Jimmy Palmiotti and Dan Jurgens come immediately to mind. Have they done that with you? Have they put you with people that they want you to help season them as editors? I, they not put it that way. I mean, it's entirely possible, but I am, I don't have any knowledge of that. And I, I don't want to say that because I don't want to in, inadvertently insult, you know, sure. but I, but I see it. I get it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's hilarious. Uh, Greg refers to you as the Johnny Cash of comics. Because <laughs> you've been everywhere, man. Absolutely, man. That's hilarious. Oh, and all right, Stanley, uh, we're opening a Pandora's box here. Would Mark ever want to write Star Trek books? Are no. you a Star Trek guy at all? No, I'm not a Star Trek guy at all. Good. I mean, again, all right. I like Star. I mean, again, I appreciate it. Same as I appreciate Star Wars. Same as I appreciate sure. a bunch of them. But I have no emotional attachment to it, so I would be a terrible person to write a, a Star Trek book. Uh, Kalai has the uh, the infinite question regarding Superman. What is your take on Superman Clark, and Clark Kent? Clark, Superman's the real guy. All right, here's all right. Here's the. I, I, we can all see the question on the screen. So, which who's right? Who's real? The real guy? Who's Superman? the real guy, Clark? Or because there's an audio audience as well. But yeah, who's the real guy, Clark or Superman? Yeah. And the answer is the answer is more complicated. I used to say the answer is Superman. That was my knee jerk response for years and years. But I've tempered my response a little bit. There's three people involved. There's not just two. There's three identities involved. There is there's Clark as he grew up in Smallville with the Kents. There is Superman. And then there is Metropolis Clark, right? There's that's a different Clark. That's the yes. disguise. So right now, of the two, Superman is the real guy, Clark is the disguise, but it's a little more nuanced than that, if you will. Metropolis, like but Metropolis Clark is clearly the disguise. Fair that's a that's a very apt observation. I don't We're, buy into this. I don't buy into, you know, Clark is who he is, Superman is what he does. I don't I don't buy into that because I think okay. that. I think that there's more to it than that. I think that th that that's the same. You could say that about a fireman, but at the end of the day, the fireman can't, you know, isn't apart from the rest of us. Isn't, you know, the reason it's Superman is, is, is what he does is not resonating with me is because he's so far different. He's so, he's so apart and removed from who we are as human beings. You've mentioned that you've talked to contemporaries about certain characters and stuff regarding Superman, that Bronze Age group. And again, these were our guys when we yeah. were adolescents. Carrie Bates, Martin Pascoe, Elliot Magan, for example, yep. those three immediately come to mind. Did you ever have a chance to talk to any of those three oh. about Superman specifically? And what a their lot. Marty cool. a lot. Elliot a lot. Remember, Elliot, I, I conscripted him to do the Kingdom Come novelization. Absolutely, you did. Yes based on the fact that his two Superman novels were two of the best Superman stories of all time. And so God bless him. He signed on. I am reminded as I scanned a bunch of pages this weekend out of a bunch of paper files, how much hell he went through to do that novelization because there were a million notes and not from me. Um, but yeah, Elliot and I have talked a lot about Superman. Marty and I talked a lot about Superman. Carrie, I just, I've never had a conversation with just because as you know, you know, he is the great white whale when it comes to trying to land him for an interview. I begged Elliot and he's like, you know, he's just a private guy. Yeah. He doesn't want to do it. And I absolutely respect that. But yeah. man, I, I mean, Carrie really was such a genius, right? And is yeah. such a genius writer. That wonderful Elseworlds that he did. Yeah. Uh, what if what if Jorel was be able, able to build rockets for him yeah. and Lara and Clark and then have a have another baby on Earth? 
and yeah. what it would have been like for all the L's to be on Earth. Man, what a, I mean, and that's never been traded. And that's one for everyone to hunt down if you're not aware of it on eBay and grab those issues because it yeah, is what, such a oh, last story. last family of Krypton, I think it's called. I'm trying to like, that. It's like that three issues done about eight or nine years ago, I want to say. That sounds about right. Uh, like and, and then when he briefly came back to Marvel in yeah. the two thousands, and yeah, I you like you're right, Mark. I tried so hard because yeah. I do. I, I just I have so much respect for Carrie. He's that's such a great writer. And, oh my God, the stories that guy's got to have. Uh, yeah, and Jeff and I, Johns have gushed about his Flash run, obviously. Yeah. Ah, so, oh, this is interesting. Um, you once said, uh, Comic Boom, you once said, Elliot Megan wrote your favorite Superman novelized story. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course, and I know what yeah. that is, but I'll let you tell it. Have you ever considered uh, adapting it into a comic? I no more than I would consider covering Van Halen. I mean, it just... I couldn't do it justice. It is it is perfect as it is. It's Miracle Monday. He did two Miracle Superman Monday. novels. One was Last Son of Krypton, which is really good. But Miracle Monday was just heartbreakingly awesome. And there's still things in that book that bring tears to my eyes. That just really deep emotional moments. And my blueprint about who Superman is, who Luther is, who these characters are. And uh, no, I mean... I, if Elliot wanted to adapt it as a comic, I'd be the first guy to buy it. But I don't, yeah, I don't think it would translate as well. I, the, well, yeah. And also, you would never, I mean, it's funny that you, like you said, you had him adapt Kingdom Come. And I right. think you have so much respect for it. You'd rather see Elliot do it. Well, there's also something else, which is that, and this is something I've learned as a publisher and editor over the years, is that novels do not, and novelists traditionally do not make great comic book writers off the bat they have to be they have to learn because remember a novel uh, novels tend to be internal conflict they tend to hinge on internal conflict comics hinge on external conflict the number of novelists who have come to me with scripts that made me want to leap off off a building are are legion because you'll get these giant panel descriptions telling you about the inner soul of the character and the kind of person they are, but it's not on the page. That's a panel description. You know, it's not on the page. Show me in dialogue, show me in action, show me in, you know, stage business. And there's not, like I said, so novels don't lend themselves to comic book adaptations very well. Uh, I'm sure that there's exceptions out there. I you actually, you know, Chaikin did stars, my destination with, with, uh, Byron Priest all those years ago, that was good. Archie Goodwin and Walt Simonson famously did the Alien movie adaptation. But by and large, those things are, are it just, it's too big. It, it, there's, you know, it's not enough room in a comic book to do what a novel can do. Agreed. And Howard and, and Archie are the kind of guys, and, and Walter as well, mm -hmm. that know how to, uh, you know, compress yeah. because they are so versed in the comic book world rather than a novelist coming to comics. You know, Tom, I, I'm sure you like, Tom DeHaven's It's Superman, or maybe oh, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, and again, if, very if you try to adapt that, that would be a that would be a fifty issue series. You know, you can't. I don't know how you do that. <laughs> I I absolutely agree with you, man. I'm on the other side of the coin. I really love Miracle Monday, mm -hmm. but for me, it's Last Son of Krypton, and uh, that that great scene where Superman's having his fever dream or whatever, and he sees angry Jor El, and then he yeah. comes out of it, and it's Luther beating him across the face <laughs> and his right. hands are bloody from trying to hit invulnerable Superman. And, uh, and Luther's like, Hey, I saved you. And, and Clark's like, actually, I think you actually finally killed me. And it was <laughs> so great. And I mean, and truly, man, that's like your moments at the end of, of uh, kingdom come and planet Krypton and stuff. It's those little moments that it's, it's like, the little moments. yeah, man, that's and them. I, and I will remind people, those books are still in print and can be found on amazon.com. And if you're, you know, book, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Elliot got the rights back. Yeah, he has made new editions mm -hmm. of both Last Son of Krypton, Krypton and Miracle Monday. He we've we've talked about that, and it, as always, whenever Elliot's name comes up, it reminds me that I got to get him back because there's a million things to talk about. And again, man, I'm I I miss uh, Marty so much. Oh, uh, I really got to know him in the last yeah. ten years of his life, and it meant a lot to me. And uh, and yeah, man, I know you would tease us, and it's true because we'd talk, and all of a sudden it's like. Marty, you know, we've been talking for uh, four hours. Oh, my God. Yeah, I know. I know. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's Marty. Um, 
Have we, have we talked, we've talked about his daredevil pro story, right? Um, feel free. I, I, I don't, I don't think you and I have. No, this is, this is, it's something that most people don't know exists. And it is, it was an, a key part of making me the writer I am today. So in the late seventies, Marvel packaged a, a series of novels, like prose novels. And in one case, a collection of short stories, uh, done by different people. Uh, Marty did a daredevil one short daredevil story he did it under the name kyle christopher as a pseudonym because he was working at dc at the time he didn't want there to be issues uh, and it's a it's a good story but what makes it great is that he's thinking about what daredevil's life is like what it's like to wake up in the morning how he envisions the world how he can tell the kind of day it is outside and what the weather is just by the smell of the air in the apartment and how the sun feels on his skin and deep diving, really deep diving into how those senses work and, and what that, and all of that, all of that is what I tried to bring to Daredevil when I wrote it. That is the key to writing all these characters. That's the key to writing Superman or Flash or Doctor Strange or Green Lantern or whoever is you need to drill down on what it's like to have these abilities and these powers every moment of the day, not just when you're punching stuff. But what is it like to live an, a life with these abilities and with these powers and with this point of view on the world? If you can do that and inhabit those characters, then you got something. But if you're just writing a bunch of superpowers, then, you know, anybody can write those kind of stories. Agreed. And in fact, I do think that is one of the kernels of Zack Snyder's Man of Steel that absolutely worked when young Clark is in the classroom. Oh, yeah absolutely overwhelmed by his powers and it takes martha to get him to focus and stuff and and uh, find a sense of normalcy yeah. while being bombarded by that sense that was a great that was a great scene i'm down with you know most of the first hour of that movie i was gonna say has and truly it was one of my favorite conversations that we had with arden franco uh was when we did tear apart man of steel yeah i i in some ways i've softened a little bit i still have my main major problems with the Kents in particular right being protecting him rather than teaching him the code of hey we're Kents we help people that's what right. we do but I don't know if your your feelings on Man of Steel have uh, evolved in any it, way in in the sense that I have I have become a little more flexible in sort of realizing that look everybody has a different idea of who Superman is and, you know, I don't get to be the ultimate arbiter of who Superman is, although if he's snapping next, that ain't Superman. But yeah, yeah, that's all that. But beyond that, like, like, like I said earlier in this broadcast, John, just don't have these characters kill people. And I'm on your side. I'm with you, man. I'm very curious, based on the title, what James Gunn's Superman legacy. Yeah, is. very, very curious. Could be John Kent. It could be a John Kent story. Yeah, uh, it could be. Uh, let's go back to the beginnings of Superman, and I also think it's a good idea to recast, just because. And Henry, yeah. Henry Cavill's great, and unfortunately, like like several James Bond actors, he was not well served. Period. Right. Yeah. But that said, you kind of want somebody that you're going to be able to have a ten year plan with, and I think Cavill is great. But it's the same problem that I think the Julie Schwartz era Superman had. That by the time you and I were reading him. He was our dad. He was really, I kind of looked at him as a guy that could have been in his 40s, frankly. That's the thing. Yeah. The Superman that you and I were reading was Mitt Romney when we were kids, you know. For real? Yeah. yeah that's, that's, a good, a, that's a good physical example. Yes. Yes. And, and, <laughs> you know, this gets back to, you know, you know, Nick Cage wanted to play Ghost Rider for a long, like he really, and he did those movies. And no one at Marvel wanted him to do these movies. No one. It had nothing to do with his talent. It had to do with the fact that if you're trying to create a franchise, you don't want to start with a guy who's in his early 50s and move on from there. Yep. You need to start with people who, you know, if they end up doing a third Shazam movie, I don't know what they're going to do with Billy. Because, you know, Billy's going to be shaving and smoking cigarettes at this point. And, uh, you know, just like not the, Gotham, the same thing. Just like the Gotham kid that played Bruce Wayne. Yeah. By the time <laughs> they got to the fifth season, yeah. he He's was six foot two. Yeah. Great. And, <laughs> yeah. really, I, and I got to be honest, and I rarely do this, yeah. but um, the kid who played Catwoman, she was great. But when she was a little kid, it was kind of that icky little yeah. girl pageant. Like, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, exactly. Little girl, man, tone it's it down. Boo-boo pageant stuff, yeah. 
kind of icky. Yeah. So she thankfully matured into the role yes. and everything. So that's so funny. I, uh, all right, a uh, couple quickies, and then you want to wrap? Yeah, or we... give, me, give me another like 10 minutes or so. Sure. That sounds perfect. Uh, and listen, everybody, uh, we're going to do a, 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 a Picard review, on, on, and we're going to jump uh, to a different link to do that. Uh, just give me five minutes in between and everything. I'm so, Mark, it touches my heart that you and I have become enough friends that we have gone from all right, 30 minutes and that's it. And then I would say, it was like, <laughs> Archie, Mark and I are in a cab and the flag would pop up. Like, all right, he needs to go. Yeah, you got to go. No problem. That's a but it means going. a lot, man. I'm totally fine with this. This is fun. This is, you, I, give, I, you give good interview. Well, um, God bless you, son. You're a good man. And you do, and you do the same. All right, Michael wants to know, now that Sherlock Holmes is officially in the public domain, would hmm. you be interested in writing that character? Of course, given your background on Ruse. No. I, <laughs> no, and i tell you why. Because Ruse was obviously you know, Sherlock Holmes, except Watson's uh, woman. And right. that was the part that I enjoyed writing. I enjoyed writing a female Watson with that snark and that, you know, who was really the kind of the, the brains, of the operation and in a sense, the heart of the, certainly the heart of the operation. That was the fun of writing Ruse. Writing, doc, writing Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson as he is now, A, I have no interest in that. And B, I don't think anybody's going to do it better than Stephen Moffat does. Because those yeah. his his Sherlock series aces all right down the line. But I felt like season four did kind of jump the shark. It did a little, but if you if you sit down and do it all, I did it all in a rewatch in one sitting once, and it holds together better than you think. Okay. Yeah. I be, I believe you. That's great. Are there any plans to omnibize your ruse run? Not that I know of. It would be nice, but I don't know. I haven't heard anything. Okay. Uh, another fast question from mm -hmm. our Burrow Snake. No nope. fourth world uh, stories interest you. No, nope, no audio. I keep stepping over for the audio audience. Are there any fourth world stories? Wanted? No. In fact, here's a story for you. So, when we wanted to do a Kingdom sequel back in the day, we wanted you know Kingdom Come was awesome, and you know where people liked it. Rather, I don't want to say it's awesome, but it would people liked it. it awesome. uh, and Paul Levitz came to us and said, you know, we want to do a follow up. Alex and I sort of went off into our separate corners and thought about what we want to do. And Alex had an awesome pitch uh, about the fourth world characters and the cosmic level of the DC universe and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it was really, and I was revisiting that stuff over the weekend because I, I had a scanner palooza party over the weekend and went through 20 year old boxes. And it was a lot of great, great stuff. But when he came back to the table, I just couldn't connect. I can't, relate to those characters i i i just can't find a way into orion and those characters. mr miracle yes mr miracle there's a mr miracle story in me somewhere but the rest of them and the the fourth world mythology it's awesome it is terrific but again like star wars i watch it from a distance and go that's awesome but i don't have any real emotional connection you know surprise me and and shame on me yeah. but i didn't see it coming cecil castellucci's fourth world story yeah. that she did with the Furies. Yes. Was so great. And I, much like putting you with Brevoard, yeah. I had uh my friend um interview uh Tom because yeah. of New Gods and Fourth World stuff and Cecil and have them talk about Kirby's Fourth World because they clearly understood it. And I thought that was that was pretty neat. Yeah. So uh I, I'm trying to find who asked the question. If I can't find it, I'll just ask it myself. Yeah. Uh favorite Fantastic Four run. Uh, Lee Kirby. Well, any specific story, I guess, is what they were looking for. But of course, anything, anything from issues 40 to 60. That's when they were in high gear. That's when everything was popping. And that was when every issue was just super inventive. I agree. The Treasury Fantastic Four was my entry point to the Fantastic Four. I was a DC kid, uh, Mark. No, and it really wasn't until the Treasury editions when we were like 9 and 10. That's yeah. kind of when I got into Marvel. And the Galactus story was a great introduction. And oh my God, when Johnny comes back from yeah. Galactus's space station and, and having seen all of them, it's his brain can't process. And it's, yeah, it, that was great stuff. I would like you, I was a DC kid. I was never, I live in the deep South. There was no distribution. It was very spotty of Marvel stuff. So you couldn't count on getting two issues in a row. And uh final question. Uh, yeah. You have any interest in returning to creator own stuff? Sure. I mean, I've got, I have some, bullets in those chambers uh i just potter's field great example man thank you you know i there's other things i've just there's only so many hours in the day 
And I'm just, it's, it's so much fun to be able to just dive through DC comics, like uncle Scrooge through the money bin, you know, going, th- I'm just feel like I'm going through it like a porpoise. And as long as I can keep that high, you know, that's, that's my main focus. But yeah, I, I've got other things eventually. Well, I know I speak for many when you say that uh, coming back to DC felt like coming home. Yeah. We feel it as well as readers because Thank truly, you. man, uh, it is so great. And you are, as I said earlier, you are giving us the familiar, but you're having new things to say about them at the same time. So everybody, if you're not enjoying uh, Lazarus Planet and uh, certainly World's Finest, we're very excited about the news that you and Hitch will be doing Superman soon. Yeah. And uh, of course, Shazam will be, and right. you know, I'm sure it'll still the title will still be Shazam. Right. And then, of course, there's the other. Oh, I can't talk about that. And there's and there's the other DC series coming, I, which I can't talk about. That's all right. Well, that gives yeah. us an excuse. I'm sure you're going to be busy. In but the we summer. will. But yeah, let's find again that. sooner than later. That'd be great, Mark. Honestly, you know it, buddy. I seriously, it means so much every time you come back. Oh, so of course, it's always a, it's always a good time, sir. Have a great rest of the evening. Enjoy your Picard or Lusa with your boys, and uh, we will talk soon. That sounds great. And everybody, um, the the link to the Picard thing that was supposed to start at 8.30, absolutely still valid. Yeah. I, I'm just delighted that Mark wanted to talk as long as he did. And that's okay. We still got plenty of time to talk about Picard with me and Franco and Mitch and Wayne. So stay tuned for that. Uh, give me like five minutes in between to just kind of readjust myself, maybe fix my hair. I got the <laughs> going. But uh, everybody, thanks a lot for this uh, conversation. You bet. Until next time, stay safe, stay happy, right. stay Take healthy. Care.